I'm uh, really pleased and honored to be asked to speak to this group and, and quite frankly how, how large the group is. I think it really speaks to just how important this topic is for, for all of us in the industry. I, I wonder a little bit of, of why I had the invitation and, and uh, because it's been years since I've attempted to be a non-practicing veterinarian and I thought maybe it was because I knew Noel who's sitting there, um, but then I decided finally I'm married to Lucina, who's from Mexico. We, we uh, met in graduate school, and my, my three children, they were all born in a different country, so that, that's the international part of this. Um, but uh, clearly, P PIC operates in, in 30 countries around the world, and as we tried to pull together information, I'll talk more about the data sources in a bit. Uh, I, I want to be sure and mention a couple people in Matt. Culbertson's team that were instrumental really in pulling this together, together William Herring, uh, as well as Dan Hamilton. So it was very much a group effort. And I know those teams are also working with the individual groups, the three universities and, and, and the other groups working on this problem with more specific information. This is meant to be just a look at the global situation. Can we learn something about that? Uh, what's working, what's not working? So this first slide, uh, you know, I, I suppose I'm showing my age a little bit because you think, has it ever been quite this volatile? I mean, we certainly have big issues as an industry that we're facing. It feels like that uh, roller coaster on the right there. Um, starting, you know, with consumer demands, and, and it's, I can tell you that is a global phenomenon. And, and yeah, maybe some of them start in, in North Europe, um, but one way or another, we, we face the same consumer demands around antibiotic usage, around animal well-being and welfare, around housing systems, uh, increasingly on some of the new technologies that we use, we're, we're getting pushback and we need to be able to address, you know, not just the direct producer level, but uh, to be able to engage in the entire chain to be able to make progress on some of these things. And I think it's always important too that we don't, um, you, need, you need to know when to stand up for things and, and when to, uh, you know, figure out how, how to make the new systems work. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, secondly, African swine fever. You know, African swine fever has been around for years and years, but the big move to, to China three years ago has completely changed our world. Uh, you know, clearly within China, uh, massive volatility. When you talk about a country with, and you pick the number here, we're going to talk about data sources in China as well, but you know, 35, 40 million sows, taking a third of those out um, during the height of ASF is, is you know, pretty dramatic. Um, just this last September, when the rebound has meant we have too many sows, the official numbers would be 4 million sows taken out of production in one month. Um, and if we think we have 7 million or so in, in North America, that, that shows you how dramatic things are going on there. That... Uh, you know, has clearly changed the Chinese industry and the level of consolidation that's happening there is really what took North America 50 years to go through. We see that kind of happening in five, so pretty dramatic. But, you know, clearly it's also affecting the global markets, it's affecting uh, Europe right now, which had continued to, to produce, to, to export pork to China, as China has gone into an oversupply situation in the last six months, that's shut off. So Europe's really hurting right now. The U.S., you know, clearly we benefited, or North America, we clearly benefited from China as well, are still to some degree today, but much less than before. So African swine fever has been a huge game changer. It's, uh, you know, a disease that absolutely puts a premium on biosecurity not just talking biosecurity, but real biosecurity. And I think, um, you know, up until recently, not very, very much as way of promising news on the vaccine front. There's been a lot of attempts for 40 years. Maybe some of this information coming out of the, you know, the, the Plum Island um, derived vaccine that's been used in, in Vietnam looks pretty darn interesting. I think it's probably early days yet to see if it's gonna protect against all different strains. And in this hemisphere, you know, the last time we had ASF in this hemisphere in 1980, um, through a joint effort, the U.S. government really helped support 
eliminating all the pigs on that island of Hispaniola. Um, I don't see that happening the same way today, but it was certainly with it that close, uh, a lot of people in this room uh, were, were concerned and looking to make sure our defenses are in place. The last one, labor challenges, and, and we heard some of it in, in Ron's note, and I suppose, you know, giving talks over 30 odd years, typically you'd have labor in there, but I have never seen a situation like we have today, um, you know, through the whole process of chain, on, critically on farm, but also on processing. Um, and it's not just here in the U.S. There, there's labor issues all over the world right now. And so I, I think there's a, a huge impact as we look at this topic, survivability related to that. So, you know, what, what can we learn from the global, um, the, the, the global trends? I, you know, the, the first thing is it's extremely difficult to come up with a global source of one data source that you can rely on for benchmarking. Um, our, our goal in this was to include as many quality sources of data as possible to best represent each region. And then basically we want to highlight the, some of those differences, see if there's, you know, core reasons that we can act on uh, for those differences and challenge us um, that we, we, there are some tools out there that we can influence today, um, our, our survivability. So just another word, this isn't in the presentation, but I, but I think I owe it to everybody to say where this data comes from, because you'll see a single number. Um, and, it, and it really is different depending on where you are in the world. I've leaned pretty heavily on the PSC team around the world. So in North America, it would be a combination of pig champ data as well as meta farms, and then PIC benchmarks. If um, I said we operate in 30 countries around the world, our tendency is, is um, to have work with uh, large accounts that are growing around the world. Um, to put it in perspective, we're, we're, a lot of this data comes from about 70, we work with about 75% of the global top 250, which would be sort of 20,000 sales and above. Um, that wouldn't just be PSE genetics, let me be clear about that, it would be across genetic groups. Um, but that's where that benchmarking information comes from. Most all these data sets, we're certainly talking hundreds of thousands, if not millions of data points in them. Um, we have a small South Africa set that, that's pig champ driven. This is on the sow and premium mortality data. I, I should split this up. Um, in Europe, it's pig champ, our internal benchmarks, and agrovision for the premium percentage only. Latin America, our PIC benchmarks with those key accounts. Brazil, our agro-series PIC partner, their, their, their benchmarks. And in China, something called WePig Annual Report. And I, I am not directly familiar with that from the team. They believe that's as close to a, a reasonable industry report as we can get. As you know, some of the official numbers are um, difficult to, 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 to try and understand. We'll see that in a minute. Um, data sources for wean to finish. Uh, North America's MetaFarms and, and PIC benchmarks. Uh, Europe, AgroSoft. Uh, Latin America PSC benchmarks, uh, including AgroSeries in Brazil, and China is, is an internal PSC benchmark. So really a combination of those different data sources. So first of all, we look at, at sow mortality. I'll give people a chance to kind of digest what's on the slide there. Um, you know, a number of, number of things jump out, I think. Uh, first of all, how high North America is. If we compare it specifically to Latin America, Brazil, Europe, um, and secondly, China really jumps out there, and, and I would caution you on the China data for this time period because included in that data are you know complete sow, sow herd depopulations to get us to that 22 percent. I think I think on the next couple of slides, the pre wean and the finishing might be more accurate uh, or insightful in China, um, but we certainly have big issues in China, and we'll touch on those. Pretty consistent with what Ron showed. If we look at pre weaning mortality around the globe, and again, I'll just pause so you can have some looks at this. Again, North America is on the high end of the scale here um, for, for different reasons, I think, and, and we'll touch on those. Brazil really shines 
um, slightly better in China. Europe has high premortality mortality as well. Part of that's related, related to genetic makeup around the world. Uh, this last one is wean to finish. Um, you'll see in North America in red is, are the wean to finish units itself. The blue number is, is the combination of the nursery and finisher. Um, you see, uh, you know, where we're at around the rest of the world. Again, advantage Brazil. Um, China begins to have difficulties uh, with this number as well. Uh, Latin America, I should say, uh, more, is heavily weighted towards Mexican data. So why do we see these differences? Uh, before we talk about the differences, I want to spend just a minute on, you know, what are the similarities to start with? And I, I've worked in the industry for 35 years. I can tell you each year the industry becomes more and more similar um, around the world. So, you know, we certainly have similar genetic backgrounds. The, the same half a dozen genetic groups would be working all over the world. You know, we have a basic F1 hybrid female and a terminal sire, depends on where you are in the world, if that's Duroc based or, or Piatrin based, but uh, real similarities there. And then increasingly, I would say, and driven out of North America originally, um, we have increasingly similar advice on facility design and flow. Um, you know, you can be out in the middle of nowhere in China and be talking to somebody from, you pick at New Hope, and they'll talk about the last visit of Joe Connor. Or, you know, you can be in the north of Mexico working with a group and bump into Gustavo and the Pipestone team. I mean, these management groups are, are, are working globally, so it's a lot of the same advice being given and the same genetics, yet we see these big trend differences. Um, so, so industry structure, I think, is important to, to talk about for just a minute as a possible reason. You know, one of them is the ownership structure. Sorry, I'm grabbing my slides here. Um, the owner operators versus employed and, and contracted systems. That's been a big fundamental change that's happened in our industry over the last 50 years. Um, and I don't believe we're going back. So that's, that's, but that can explain some of the differences, I believe, globally. Um, and as Ron showed, you know, there's some difference in this large farm, small farm. But again, the reality is the whole world's going to large farms. Um, facility design. You know, that's probably most an issue on, uh, on sows. We, we, we talked about the pen systems and the flooring configurations, et cetera. I think there's been more changes around that. Um, but the base idea of weaning pigs off-site and the wean to finish or nursery finishers, that original North American idea is now all over the world. Um, labor costs and availability, um, I, you know, I'm going to, as we go through here, you're going to see, I, it is an issue for, for everybody around the world, but it's more of an issue in particular markets. And, and as I say, it's not just cost, because we're not doing a cost competitiveness analysis here. It's about availability of, of labor and how we uh, train and develop labor. Um, the, the, the next one is the sow feeding and condition strategies, I called it. I, I, I know uh, internally within PIC we have uh, quite a bit of... Um, debate on this and, and we'll continue to look at it globally. You know, historically, I would say the Americas, but in particular North America, we've gotten better at the, the efficiency of feeding sows and the, the condition to do that. We're probably closer to the edge, um, would be an opinion or a speculation, um, than say uh, uh, Europe. But we're, we're trying to collect some big data sets and to have real information to make those decisions on, because everybody has an opinion on sow condition, right? But how do we actually show the relationship with, with mortality or not, in particular that, that peri farrowing time? Um, so I, I don't think there's a conclusion there yet. Um, we, we, we know if we get extremes on either end that that's a problem, but where is optimal in the new housing systems and in the health that we deal with? Um, I, I think w we still need to understand that. And then finally, this transition to pens, if, if I look at, um, you know, how in, in particular North America, the most recent one to go through it, I, I'm not standing up here saying, you know, hey, let's go back and refight that fight. I, I'm just saying I think we've struggled, in particular during the transition from created systems to pens, 
but even within pen systems, and that relates to that labor situation, uh, or how we manage that from a mortality standpoint. And then, you know, I would, I think, be irresponsible if I didn't say I think health, core health has a lot to do with this. Um, and, and it's not just the baseline health and the endemic bugs that we're dealing with, it's uh, the volatility of the health. You know, most recently, we would have seen that with the, the sort of wave of, of PRS. You know, we've gone through a lot of these before, but as we get a tougher strain, historically 174, this last year 144, we see these huge jumps. Um, that's related to location, it's related to pig density and endemic diseases. I, I think it's, it's a little bit of, of a mentality of what we're willing to live with and where do we draw lines on things, and we'll talk about some more in th that in a second. You know, uh, there was a day not, not that many years ago, 30 years ago, where we dealt with a lot of, you know, APP and rhinitis and mange and all, all these kind of diseases that as an industry we sort of made our mind up to say we can't live with those things economically and got rid of them one way or another. Um, and I know PRS is not that easy, haven't worked on it my whole career, but I, I think there are times when we're going to have to look at this endemic si situation and, and, and draw a tighter line uh, on those issues. So what do we learn around the regions? Um, you'd see there, and this is pretty consistent, that in Brazil survivability is, is high really on all phases of production. Um, I, I would start with the high health uh, situation they have in, in Brazil, and really that's driven for the most part by no PRS, but uh, other serious diseases as well. Um, you know, historically they've had an advantage on, on labor. That's changing in Brazil right now. Labor costs are going up, so they're constantly under pressure too, but if you compare it to a North American situation, Brazil would have an advantage on labor. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of integrated systems. Uh, if you look at BRF or, or Sierra, JBS, uh, uh, there's, that model has really grown in Brazil, and so there's a real, yeah, but there's still a co-op uh, uh, situation in Brazil with Aurora and others. So it's really a mix. I don't think you can go to one particular farm type. It's certainly not small farms o only in Brazil. And there's a lot of large farms there. Um, you know, Europe is stronger in sow mortality um, and, and growing pigs as compared to pre wean mortality. Um, and uh, one of the problems with Europe is, you know, we define it as one thing, but it's a huge place and, and a big industry with, you know, 12 plus million sows spread out in a lot of different systems. But historically, we, there would be smaller farms. There are more owner operators. Um, I, I think in much of Northern Europe, they've sort of led the way on welfare standards. And so uh, by definition, you have more individual treatment and follow up. Depending on where you are in North Europe, really, um, you would have straw-based systems. The extreme being the UK, where now half, half the pigs are reared out, outside, but, but even you know, in, in Denmark and North Germany and other places, you, you would have some straw in their system. Um, and, and on top of that, really less fully slatted units. Um, the premium trends are up for, for a number of different reasons. You know, one of those, again, depending on which country you're in, you're starting to see different system changes like uh, Freedom Pen and Fairwing um, production practices. I, I've yet to see any of those that it doesn't raise premium mortality. Um, and, I, and I think also if you look at kind of the push in Europe to, you know, be total born driven at the expense sometimes of, of birth weight and other things has meant that uh, genetically we end up with a lot of small pigs and that's hit premium mortality. That's changing as we speak, the, the piglet size. So we already touched on some of the China stuff. Um, you know, yeah, amazingly rapid growth, not just rapid growth. You know, you, you talk to people in China and they, they sort of talk in million pig increments and it used to be, we thought it was just talk, but over, over the billions of dollars that have been invested over the last three years to change this industry is pretty phenomenal. So it is a combination of new and very old facilities. Um, so anytime you look at, at that, it's a, it's a challenge. You know, it's a challenge in China to find land to build new facilities, which is one of the reasons, and we can argue 
the sense of this or not, but it's one of the reasons why these multi-story pig farms are being, being built. Um, you know, bottom line, it's really a new workforce. Historically, China was a backyard pig producer. It's not, increasingly not now. These are modern pig units. But if you look at the base biosecurity um, mechanisms in China, and some of them are pretty crude, um, it's a real challenge. So as an example, um, most pig units would have the staff live on the pig unit. They actually have a sort of gray zone in between the external barrier and the, and the internal where there's a dormitory and people sleep there and eat there. They quarantine first and then get in. In addition with ASF, there's been some real, I would say draconian and maybe not very sensible biosecurity measures where you know, it takes the best part of a week and a half to get onto a farm. So once people are on the farm, they're on the farm. And these farms, as, as they are in the rest of the world, are spread out all over the place. So attracting people in a, yeah, there's 1.3 billion people in China, but they're increasingly in cities and attracting a labor force that, that will go out and live remotely in a rural area is tough. And you get people with no pig experience at all, and really people training people with no pig experience. And so it's been a huge learning curve, and I don't think it's over or even close yet. Um, yeah, maybe beating on this one, but the, the stability of the health situation is, is what really has, has caused problems there. And, and, and I think, you know, uh, until as an industry, there's some seriousness around, for example, keeping ASF positive pork out of the chain, um, I believe they'll continue to struggle w with that. So on the one hand, we're going through these kind of farm by farm biosecurity issues, but on a broader sense, I think there's much more that could be done, um, and much more that could be done to bring some sense to how we monitor for ASF within China, and then how it's acted upon, slaughtered out, and the meat not going through the chain. Uh, that's a tough thing to do, and a tough thing that I don't think that, you know the government really has wrestled down yet. Um, but until they do, it's, it's set up for an endemic situation and really a, a bet that a vaccine is going to help um, because, you know, given the scale and the, the, the density in China, um, you're just not going to control it with, with current means. Um, when ASF first came into China, I mean, we were talking about this pig density issue. Um, I compared the, the pig density in Iowa, which, you know, has around about 25% of the pigs in the U.S., their pig density, uh, and if you look at all the provinces within China, I think Iowa would come in 12th or 14th. It, it, it was certainly in the bottom half. There's that many more places in China where pig density is greater. So that's the challenge that you got into. You get ownership challenges, middlemen challenges, reporting challenges. I think with the diagnostics, they quickly went into private hands, into company hands, and everybody is doing thousands, hundreds of thousands of PCRs for ASF. And I think sometimes acting on some pretty questionable uh, results and not accepting that there might be false positives. So you have these things like test and remove, et cetera. But this isn't about ASF in China. Uh, it's meant to be about mortality around the world. So we'll move on. North America, Ron, went through some of those issues. You know, we've also seen recent growth, we shouldn't forget about that, and consolidation and increased farm sizes. That's been a trend that's gone on for a long time, but it hasn't slowed down. Um, yeah, I don't think I have to remind this group the shortage of skilled people to work on farms. Uh, one we kind of gloss over is the reduction in antibiotic use, and I think, you know, it absolutely needed to happen, but I don't know that we've, for example, in the sow herd, adapted yet to that, and, and maybe this changes our view of what we do with endemic background disease because we're not going to be able to, to you know, blanket use of, of antibiotics, which, which we relied on historically. Um, you know, there's an increase in euthanasia rates. Every time we look at a reason uh, for mortality, um, I think with the increased uh, scrutiny, the welcome scrutiny, uh, but it's meant a lot of animals that, that sows that would have gone to town before are not now when we euthanize. Um, in a responsible way quickly on farm, that leads to increased mortality, of course. And then finally, health. You know, we still, uh, for all the right logistics reasons, are, 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 you know, left with some pretty intense pig dense areas. And we're gonna, ch we're gonna, you know, we 
we've got out some of that with filters, but it's still going to be a challenge as we go uh, go on, and and we're going to get you know new strains that pop up, no, no question. And that's had an impact in the last two years. So what what are some of the lessons we can learn from this? Um, you know, biosecurity. Uh, it, it is about prevention and it's about mindset and you know there's tons of available material but but those of you who have lived it, um, it it's it really does have to be cultural within companies to make to make a difference um, and as leaders I, I think it's really important for us to to show the way there and then you know finally I think there's innovation it, it really ultimately is the way we we win here Part of that is system and facility design. We don't have a lot of time to talk, but there's been relatively little change in that over the last 30 years. I, I, you know, there's some good notable exceptions um, related to labor utilization, as an example. If we look at what we, how we handle sow feeding and farrowing would be a, an example. Uh, but I think we have to be more efficient. Um, the labor situation's not going away. Um, technical inputs, and these can fit into a lot of different buckets. Um, you know, one of them I referred to before on the health side, this endemic disease, uh, Maria Lavajo, is that works with us at PSE in Iowa State, has done a lot of work about how do we identify the parasuases, the asuases, the, the, the mycoplasma, you know, hyosinovias and, and hyorhinuses, and just those bugs that we, we take as given are in all these units. They're, they're not all the same, and, and certainly our approach and control and vaccination um, shouldn't be the same. So I think bringing more technology to that front is, is really important. And then uh, last but not least, I think I'd be uh, remiss if I didn't say genetics definitely plays a role. Just a couple quick slides on the genetics piece because I realize I'm going long here. Um, one of the things is where we get our data and, so, and a big shift for us over the, as it pertains to mortality, because mortality as far as traits go, is, is relatively low frequency, and, and it's extremely environment dependent. So just collecting data on livability and mortality in high health nucleus herds with you know, a lot of square footage and, and uh, diets, et cetera, it, it isn't good enough. And so starting about 15 years ago, we began to collect data at the commercial level on particular systems. We used to have to do it with single sire matings and tags because essentially we wanted pedigreed offspring from the nucleus that we could then, the next generation, use that data in our selection decision. And uh, today we do it with a parentage test, so we don't even have to tag those animals to get that information. It's been an extremely powerful tool that has taken our heritabilities up on survivability so we can sel select directly for it now instead of uh, uh, before, or it was very difficult, lowly heritable. Um, and it's really the sire line side of this has led the way. It's more straightforward, but we're we're implementing it more and more now on the uh, on the female side of it too, and especially as it relates to to sow mortality and and uh, you know, the causes for that. I, I think an extremely powerful tool. Um, this next one, feet and leg structure. We've always selected for feet and leg structure, and we did it in a in a in a you know object, objective way that was developed over many years, and not just use it as an independent culling like you do on a selection of a group of gilts, but include the information in the, the family history and so you can select on it and change it over time on leg structure. Um, lately, as we look at some new technology things, we're looking at different ways to phenotype or gather that information that'll bring more accuracy, be more cost effective and allow us to do on more animals. One of those is, is to use video and we uh, work both internally and with a group in uh, Belgium as well as Michigan State on some of this work to be able to not just define leg structure but also movement. And if this works, this multicolored pig should move. Um, so so you know, finding joint locations, body segments, and footfall events to try and not just capture how that, how that foot looks but also ultimately how the pig moves. Um, The initial results, and this is from a fairly small data set, 400 gilts, suggests that, it's, it, it, that it will be a useful tool, at least as accurate as we are scoring them ourselves, and we have a certification process for scoring, so um, I'm, I'm positive on that. The next step is to, to 
to use it on a much larger scale to be able to do it and include it as well in cell longevity. Uh, so it's not just information on legs, but also are we influencing the mortality. Uh, oops, I went past one. All right, um, just the last thing on innovation to, uh, to deliver the change here. Um, we don't have time to go in a lot of depth today, but many of you have followed the gene editing as a, as a platform. Um, I, I think it could really be a tool for us to help get at disease resistance, which is a, a difficult set of traits to get at historically. Um, PRS is the most advanced, and we can talk some more, or I can talk individually with you some more about where we're at in that program. Um, but certainly there's other targets, influenza, a African swine fever, other ways that we're going about that. Um, I, 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 you know, that program is, is going along. It's taking longer than we'd like or everybody would like, but, uh, you know, there's biology involved, there's regulation involved, there's a lot of different steps to, that, to get that right. But I, I think by far the most critical step is the one we're about to face, which is market acceptance. And I don't mean market acceptance in the, you know, producer processor, or at least the procurement side of processor. This is about market acceptance at retail and food service level. And so we're being very careful and deliberate on how we do that. Uh, I should add, it also means you need regulatory approval, not just in the U.S., where we're working with the FDA, but also uh, we're not going to go forward in North America unless we also have Canada, Mexico, China, Japan, and Korea because of the export dynamics of that. So that makes it a bit more challenging on the regulatory side. But I, I still think ultimately it's going to come down to, um, you know, the benefits, the animal well-being benefits, the re reduced use of antibiotics, the sustainability benefits have to be put in, in the right way with the retail and food service that are taking the brand risk to be able to bring this forward. And we're being careful, I, I think, for the right reasons. You know, if we don't get this one right, this, this whole area, this whole platform could have trouble for a while. And it, it's a powerful thing to be able to just change, you know, to take out a few base pairs in a three billion uh, base pair genome and to have a huge impact like we see, for example, with PRS. So we need to do that right. Um, you know, I, I think we have to accept that development's gonna be longer than, than vaccines, you know, if, if we could have effective vaccine development and maybe some of this messenger RNA stuff will help us get closer. Um, but it's, you know, there's biology involved. And in particular, if, if you have a recessive, if, if the edit acts as a recessive trait where you need to turn over whole pyramids to get the effect, um, we should go into it with a mentality that this isn't an overnight light switch. Now, other ways to get dominant traits, that, that, that's another discussion and I think would help us go to market faster. But to, in today's world, how to scale that up is, is really an interesting challenge. Oops. So, you know, these differences exist, but I'd say the challenges are remarkably consistent. Um, I, I, you, we'd have to start with how, how to keep herds clean. Um, I think there's going to be innovation from a lot of different segments here to get at this problem. It's a, it's a huge problem, and, and it one, it's one that consumer expects us to solve. Um, so with that, I'll leave with a Charles Darwin quote um, about our most noble attribute. Um, so, you know, part of this is about economics, part of it is that we, we need to do the right thing. And so uh, that, that for me is a good challenge for all of us. Thank you.